All right, we're going to get started now, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Monarchs, Milkweed, and Migration with Maine Master Naturalist, Serene Sligonia. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library. We've been pleased to co-sponsor the daytime lecture series with the Belfast Garden Club this year, and we were really glad we could do so for them and for us and to bring everybody together in our Zoom room. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Before I turn the mic over to Corliss Davis from the Garden Club for updates and to introduce our speaker, I just want to remind everyone to please keep your mic muted during the program and to let you know that the program is being recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel. All right, Corliss, your turn. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you for all of the support you've provided to us over the last year in doing these Zoom programs. Um, we welcome everyone to this program, which is our last uh, public program until the fall, until October. Um, but we do hope that you'll watch the BelfastGardenClub.org website for news about our plant sale, which is coming up on June 5th, and our 2021 Summer Open Garden Days tours. Um, as Brenda mentioned, the program today is called Monarchs, Milkweed and Migration what we are learning and what they need to survive as a species. Our speaker, Serene Slagona, is a Maine master naturalist, and she has studied these beautiful butterflies since the age of 12. She presented yearly monarch research projects with children while she was an elementary and middle school teacher, and she continues to rear, release, and tag monarchs every summer and has had the privilege of visiting their overwintering sites in Mexico. Please put your questions for Serene in the chat and my co-chair, Margaret Campbell, will read them after the presentation. Serene, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank the library and the Garden Club for inviting me to present and for all of you who have um, come to hear about Monarchs, Milkweed and Migration. And I need to start my slideshow. Okay, the question, why monarchs? Why, um, why study them? Why care about them? Well, first of all, they're beautiful. Um, learning about monarchs, observing, um, it's an engaging process. It never gets old. There's always something to learn or relearn. Um, and monarchs are a great introduction to entomology for people of all ages. Um, it's a way to engage in citizen science. Um, there is a great deal of research going on um, to help understand the migration of an insect that travels up to 3000 miles and weighs less than a gram going to a place where they've never been before. Um, how do they do it? Um, monarchs as teacher, I consider that monarchs have very much been my teacher, especially um, the caterpillars, the larva. Um, and that was so until I went to Mexico and I was able to see the um, overwintering sites and the millions of monarchs that are there. Um, monarchs teach about the interconnection of life, what's in the soil, the incredible plant that is milkweed, the insect itself, the life cycle, how the insect behaves in all um, of the four stages of life. If I was in Africa, probably I would have been studying elephants. Um, England, it would be badgers, bluebirds, daffodils, oak trees. They, if you focus on one of them and then branch out, um, there's an incredible web of learning and of life connected there. Monarchs are considered a significant indicator species. What's happening to them is happening to insects around the world, 
all life forms. They're iconic and a monarch butterfly is recognized around the world. We're gonna talk about the life cycle, migration and overwintering. The overwintering of monarchs is the lar second largest gathering of life forms on earth. The only life form that congregates more is ocean krill. We'll talk about threats to monarchs, natural and otherwise, milkweed, and so forth. Monarch butterfly, Danaeus plexippus plexippus. Um, the plexippus is repeated for the North American monarchs because they are the migrators. The host plant is milkweed, and they're in the family Nymphalidae. And in this family, the butterfly holds its four wings, the front two feet, oh, sorry, not four wings, four feet um, up against their body. So when you look at a monarch, you would expect to see six legs of an, of an adult insect, but you only see four. Um, and in this family, when they're at rest, they tend to hold their wings flat. Here is, um, the male and the female. The way that you tell the difference be between the male and female is this little dot right here. Can you all see my cursor moving? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. my arrow. This little dot is the indicator for male. There'll be a quiz on this in a few minutes. Um, the Viceroy is one that we frequently see in Maine. In fact, this was taken in a raspberry patch in Belfast. Um, you can see how closely the Viceroy resembles the, the monarch, except for this telltale ridge on the hind wing of the Viceroy. It's here on the Viceroy, not here on the monarch. This is the, the, the yearly calendar for monarchs. And we're right about here in this range here. Um, breeding began in the overwintering sites in mid-February. Um, and then the females started heading up towards Texas, um, depositing their eggs and then the first generation moves on up through the North American continent. Um, and we will see monarchs somewhere between, if we're lucky, the end of June, um, but into July and August is when we should see them. And what we're seeing are the third and the fourth generations in particular. Then the migration starts mid-August, the monarchs start heading south and they're traveling up to 3000 miles till the end of October, November, where they begin the overwintering season. Um, and the cycle starts again. Monarch life cycle. Well, there are two different phases to the cycle. There's spring to summer, and then there's the migratory and overwintering population. There, if you look at the egg, larva, chrysalis, and adult, you see that there's a range of days, three to five, nine to 14, eight to 13. This is an average and that cycle depends on the temperature and the angle of the sun. It speeds up, certainly during the summer, you can have um, a two week to three week turnaround of a generation. Later in the summer, the days go longer 
And again, they're very responsive to the amount of sunlight and the sunlight gives them the signal for when they're to head south. And that's what we call the, the, the migrators, the, the super migrators is what we're hoping for. Those are the long, uh, long winged strong flyers who leave Canada, uh, the Midwestern Plains and the East Coast. They're arriving in a very small area in Michoacan, the state of Michoacan in Mexico. It's about 70 miles long. Um, the, the area where they head to. When they reach, not actually when they reach, but this generation is in the state of what's called diapause. They're non-reproductive. So even though they're down there in large numbers, there is no sexual activity until mid-February. And again, the sun is giving them the signal, hey, it's getting time. Um, mating becomes rather um, crazed um, at, uh, on certain days. Uh, and then the movement north begins again in March. Everyone heads north. Um, the males don't go very far because their job and their journey is coming to an end there. The females tend to make it a little farther north, but they're in search of the milkweed and places to lay their eggs. A female monarch loaded with eggs is looking for the freshest milkweed she can find. On average, she can lay up to 300 eggs. Some, some have been reported as high as 500. Um, here, is the egg and she has it has a, a little substance on it that's uh, like glue and she'll plant it on the underleaf but not just on the underleaf it can be anywhere on the milkweed plant usually hopefully it's going to be one egg per plant but you'll find that monarchs break the rules all the time <laughs> um the survival of the eggs for each monarch, few to none. Here's the cycle up from where the egg is deposited through the larval stage. Egg, when this egg is ready to hatch, you'll see a little black dot at the top and that's the head of the monarch caterpillar eating its way out. And then you'll find a tiny little piece, a tiny little caterpillar. Um, and this is the first instar, the first stage. As the monarch caterpillar goes through each of these stages, first, second, third, fourth, they will grow to a size where they have to molt, they have to shed their skin and then that skin, that body fills out the, the skin until you get to the fifth instar. Mm -hmm. They have very prescribed ways of eating. Um, these are a, gr a group that I had uh, two years ago. Um, you can hear them eating and they are basically eating machines from when they hatch from the egg to the fifth end star, they multiply their body weight by 2000. Okay. Fifth instar, the caterpillar isn't so concerned about eating. It's looking for a place to anchor itself. And it's, it, it has always, since it was a caterpillar, uh, been able to lay down a, a line of silk thread. 
when it's in the fifth instar, it makes a little silk pad um, on something that they feel is stable, like a twig or the side of a house or something that doesn't vibrate because uh, they're very sensitive to that motion. Um, they attach their back end to that silk pad. And over a couple of days, you'll see this caterpillar in the J form slowly transform. You'll see some green appearing. And then at some point, this skin will split in the back all the way up. And this green um, flubber-like um, shape appears and it will, sorry, hold on. It will gyrate to get rid of this uh, no longer needed skin. You can see it's shriveled up here until this green chrysalis takes shape and sets. Now, people talk about this being um, like jelly in here, uh, this being jelly. It isn't. All of the cells that are here are already predetermined for what they're going to do. Because if you look at the chrysalis here, you can already see the shape of the wings and the body. It's already there from as soon as, as, soon as the skin is shed. Over the days, you'll see this for about five days and then very slowly, you'll start to see the colors develop stronger and stronger until the day where if it's very quiet in your house, you can hear the crack of this outer cuticle and watch the monarch. Here are the antenna in place. It will drop out. The body drops out. The legs are already holding on. It knows exactly what to do. And you'll see this crumpled up little ball of color that over the hours expands into the full adult. The wings are quite soft for the first couple of hours. Um, it takes them a, a, about a day to feel confident enough to spread their wings and the new cycles begun. All right, now, male or female? Female. Good, yes. Pass the test with flying colors, no dot. No dot. Okay. Monarchs, um, as with all life forms, uh, deal with infections, illness. The major problem for monarchs, uh, which people who are concerned with monarchs uh, they work with trying to minimize the effect of this um, parasite. Um, I am not good at saying the name, no, and everybody just goes to OE. So it's the life cycle of OE in the butterfly. Most, many female butterflies already have the spores on their body. So when they deposit an egg, the spores are scattered around the milkweed and on the egg. The larvae comes out, emerges, uh, hatches from the um, egg case and um, ingests the parasite um, as it's eating the milkweed. And the monarch can tolerate a lot of this um, the, a lot of the parasite, but there comes a, a breaking point where when the, if it makes it to the J stage, this is often where people who are uh, watching the larva 
notice that something's not right. And rather than this strong J form um, being maintained, the, the monarch goes weak and it's being overcome by the parasite. Um, and it, it can easily die at this point. If the monarch is strong enough and there aren't, they don't, it isn't overwhelmed by the parasites, it will carry on um, it can even at this point die because it can be overcome. You'll see the chrysalis not go from green to orange, but green to black. Mm -hmm. And again, that is the death of, 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 the, of the chrysalis. Many monarchs can overcome it and emerge, but with, the, with that emergence, they carry on that, the spores of the, of the parasite. So this is something that people struggle against um, when they are doing any home rearing um, by washing milkweed, washing the eggs, washing the milkweed in a solution of a very mild solution of bleach and water um, to help control this. Threats to monarchs. Well, quite frankly, the biggest threat to monarchs is CO2. Um, our climate change, uh, the climate change on earth is very much um, affecting monarchs as with other life forms. Um, predators, uh, natural, um, a, as I said, a, a monarch female can lay between three and 500 eggs and all of them can be um, consumed by predators. Um, and we'll talk about what they are in a few minutes. The disease, the OE that I've already mentioned, the, the disease with the parasites, um, there are a number of others that um, monarchs uh, can fall prey to. Um, about three years ago, I was raising my first generation of monarchs, and I lost 70 um, within a couple of weeks to something I had never encountered before, and it's called um, the Black Death. And uh, none, of the, none of that generation that I had survived. Um, never had it before and hope to never experience it again. Uh, the threats to monarch include the weather. Um, when they're migrating, um, the winds, the cold uh, can have an effect on whether they reach um, the overwintering grounds. While they are overwintering, um, they can, ex because the OML forests have been thinned through logging, um, the canopy that protects them has been um, perforated. And so, they can run into real issues during the overwintering. Uh, drought in the overwintering sites is an issue as throughout the whole migration. Um, fragmented habitat. Um, throughout, especially the Midwest, um, the, the milkweed, the vast expanse of milkweed has been interrupted through farming. Um, the quality of the prairie has been um, disrupted significantly. Um, and I mentioned uh, just before about the OML forest, the old growth trees have been removed through for logging. Um, and so the trees that are there are younger uh, and in areas are, are thinner. So that's an issue. Um, the lack of nectaring sites, especially during the fall migration, um, where uh, because the monarchs that are migrating south are feeding all along the way, because when they get to Mexico and they're in the overwintering sites, they don't feed. So they have to um, exist off of the accumulated body fat. They do drink um, water, they seek out water at the, at the sites. Um, 
but no food. So these are reasons why anything we can do to help does matter. The bad news about monarchs is we have lost 96% of their population since the mid seventies. And this is, this chart starts in 1993 and it ends 2020, 21. And you can see there were some real positive spikes. Um, this was a spike a couple of years ago where people were seeing monarchs everywhere, uh, caterpillars everywhere. Um, um, I was running around looking for um, milkweed wherever I could find it. And I would find plants that had four or five larva eating away. And uh, I had to find them new plants. Um, and then suddenly there was a drop. And then last year, um, it was even worse. So this was frightening. This year I found three caterpillars um, all year. So it's the chart says it all. Conservation efforts, um, tagging. One of the major programs in the United States is a program called Monarch Watch, which is out of the University of Kansas at Lawrence. It was started by a, an entomologist named Chip Taylor, who still runs the program. And there's another slide that you'll see, but you, you can see a code here. Uh, this is the, the email address of Monarch Watch. Monarch Watch, here's the phone number, and here's a code that is specific to this butterfly. Um, it's one I tagged probably about five years ago. And now I'm going to slip over to a, um, a video that I need to um, cut. So if you will bear with me. that's just a great monarch butterfly migration day. Depending on where you're located in the eastern part of the United States, monarch butterfly tagging could start in August, mid-August, or the 1st of September. Our tagging activities today are being conducted with our friends at Monarch Watch. I'm sure there's gonna be people watching this video that are concerned about the tags harming the butterflies. You need to know that Monarch Watch has been tagging butterflies for 26 years, since 1992, and citizen scientists have now tagged over 1.5 million monarch butterflies, and the tags don't interfere with the flight or harm the butterflies. Tagging monarch butterflies is an important citizen science project because it tells us all kinds of things. Where the monarchs in Mexico originated from, the flow of the migration, the timing and the pace of the migration, mortality that occurs during the migration, and changes in geographic distribution of the butterflies. Whether your monarch butterfly was raised from an egg or a caterpillar, or it was wild caught, there's very specific information that we record for each monarch butterfly we tag. Two, three, three, nice female. The date, the location, the sex of the butterfly, and the tag number. These tags are then placed in a very specific location on the butterfly, not to hinder their flight. The tag is placed on the discal cell on the hind wing of the butterfly. Once the monarch is tagged and we've recorded all the appropriate information, it's released back into the wild to continue its migration to Mexico. There. Okay. There is a um, partner program called Journey North which is a educational site. It's also, it also has a tracking component. 
And this is a, a journey north mapping report of uh, each of these dots are reports that people have made when when they first when they saw their first monarch um, egg caterpillar or um, butterfly, um, and you can track with Journey North when they start, uh, when the migration starts, and where they are throughout the season. Um, this flag right here is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So Maine is somewhere in here. So people around the world are reporting in as to sightings. It's another citizen science activity that is, um, it is making a significant contribution to our understanding of monarchs. If you look at this map though, you'll notice here we are, but you'll notice that there are orange dots all over the place. We have ideas about how the monarchs got in these different places, Hawaii, um, New Zealand, Australia, over here in Europe. Um, it is believed that the monarchs here have, got, have arrived in Europe via strong winds that carry them aloft. And again, a, a, an adult butterfly weighs less than a gram. So the winds carry the butterfly aloft and uh, you get reports of them in Ireland suddenly settling down. The thing about these monarchs here though, these are non-migratory. The ones that migrate are here. And the, those are the ones that are of major concern. Monarchs are, oh, sorry, it's a sensitive screen. Okay. Um, monarchs are now working their way up this season. They're in this area and they're gonna work their way up through, through the corn belt up until there's no more milkweed. Um, monarchs along the East Coast have been seen as far north as Labrador. And then the Southern migration, the fall migration begins coming down in great numbers. You can see this orange band goes down here. Uh, East Coast monarchs tend to follow the coastline. That's why when you're out on any of the islands in the late summer, you can often see um, monarchs, numbers of monarchs. In fact, um, in talking with someone from the Wildlife Refuge uh, in Rockland, um, there was a conversation with a woman who wanted to go out to um, Matinicus because she remembered um, about 80 years ago being out there as a child and seeing the islands covered in orange, blanketed in orange. There were so many monarchs headed south. So the monarchs follow, tend to follow the coastline here. And depending on the prevailing winds, monarchs often enter up, uh, enter uh, the area of, of Florida and they're pretty much caught there. The ones that are here don't migrate. So there is a, a, a large population of um, monarchs that are down the Florida area, following along the coast down to the overwintering sites. The highest flying monarch that was documented, 11,000 feet, more than two miles high. But this is the gap that they fly in, this is the atmospheric gap. Um, we can see them easily at 300 feet. And in the Midwest, they talk about an undulating 
ribbon of orange flying through the sky. Um, it's rather, it's good science, but it's also beauty. Um, monarchs travel, um, again, depending on the weather, um, 50 to 100 miles a day. Takes them two months to get from the northern part of um, the states to the south, to Mexico. The farthest ranging monarch is recorded as traveling 265 miles a day. And I trust um, the, um, the site that gave the information, but it doesn't explain how they know that that butterfly traveled that far. So question to be answered. This is one of my favorite photographs of monarchs in Mexico. Now, if you can imagine from horizon to horizon, 360 degrees, that is what you see. It's an amazing sight um, and I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to go and be there um, and grateful is the word. When you're there, um, when you're in the forest, there are two sites that are um, um, readily accessible. Um, you go to one is, let's we'll just talk about El Rosario, which is the largest and the most well-known of the overwintering sites. You um, have two options. One is to walk, climb. Um, there are trails that you have easy access to, or you can ride mountain ponies. And they're, they're a pleasure. You have a guide that goes with you guiding the pony at all times. Um, and you go up into the areas where you see, these are um, the Oyamel fir trees. Oyamel evidently translate, translates as sacred. Um, and you'll see these branches that are laden down. Think of our pine trees and then bending them down is the weight of thousands and thousands of monarchs. They're all clustered here. That's what you see, a cluster, clusters, more, they, you are surrounded by them. This is my video, which it, I, um, I think I was just stubborn in including this because this, when this video plays, it, you were surrounded by butterflies in this area. Um, and for some reason, no, it won't play. When you're um, in the mountains, you have the opportunity um, to sit for as long as you want. If you go up early morning, you can spend until evening there. Um, while you're there, you are asked to be quiet. Um, you are also asked not to touch a butterfly, whether it's living or dead. The wonderful thing is, though, if you sit very still amongst the butterflies, they will come to you. Um, here's my friend Jane, who received some um, monarch earrings, temporary. And um, um, that one is sitting on my finger. I think it was, it, it rested on my pant leg and I just put my finger down and it crawled up um, again. It's considered a blessing if the monarchs uh, trust you enough to, to settle on you. And so good memories. Again, another shot of just 
cluster after cluster of butterflies. One of the most beautiful things to see, and I don't have a video to show you, is when the sunlight rests for an extended period, say on a branch here, that branch will start to shimmer. And the butterfly wings are starting to move. And then all of a sudden it will become a waterfall of butterflies, the wing. Here's another short clip I'd like to show you. And again, bear with me while I get to the site. This is a YouTube video. It gives you a good idea idea of what it's like, but I'd like you to see the camera that they are using to photograph this. And it's not the kind of camera that most of us have. Um, the beauty of the experience of being with the butterflies. This is just the beginning. Not sure if you listen carefully, you can hear it, but that's no wind. That is the sound of millions of butterflies flying around me right now. And it's probably my favorite sound ever. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, so insane. Meet one of nature's greatest treasures the overwintering site of the monarch butterfly migration. To understand the migration, you have to realize that many of these butterflies are the great-great-grandparents to next year's migrants. Their journey took an average of 1,800 miles to get down here and spend the winter. This spring, it will take three generations of butterflies into the summer to travel back up throughout North America. Each of these butterflies has its own unique story of how it ended up here. So we can't go any further on this trail and there's about a million reasons why if you look up ahead and, and I gotta get this because on the hand of my lovely camera woman, what just happened? Hi, hey, hi. <laughs> look, it's... It wants to be famous. Wants to give me a kiss. So they actually close the trail up ahead because if you look, the entire trail is covered in butterflies getting sun for the day. And it is, it's amazing. Everywhere I look, it just gets better here. These butterflies are the survivors. It is getting harder and harder for them to complete this journey and their population is dropping because of it their native prairies in the U.S. have started to disappear. But if you want to help these butterflies in their migration, you can. The best thing to do is simple. Plant native flowers for them to fuel up on and native milkweeds for them to lay eggs on and they will come. There's more to that, um, um, but I've just done a time check for myself and I, um, I've shortened that. Um, I'm gonna talk about milkweed, um, which is the plant that um, the larva of the monarch is completely dependent on. Um, May we have 40s, and you compare that to Texas, 37. Milkweed contains, a to uh, contains toxic cardenolides, um, which monarchs have the ability to store within their body and not harm them. Um, the toxin, 
that's in their body um, is a deterrent to other predators, especially birds. Um, and um, farmers don't like it because of, um, but it is an essential plant for the monarchs. Um, this is my favorite patch. It's where I grew up. And I've really become fascinated with milkweed over the past year, especially. Um, milkweed grows in colonies um, and they can be huge colonies. Out of a uh, colony, uh, thousands of shoots can emerge. Um, the buds emerge about May, so it's a little early uh, from the rhizomes. Um, when you drive past a field of milkweed, you can almost consider it as, as one large plant. So this is what... Problems though, this is an updated map of um, the uh, US drought monitor system. This is Texas. And this is where the monarchs are flying up through. Here's the United States. This is the range that they're going through, facing drought. And here's Maine. We are considered abnormally dry and this is expected to increase over our summer. So the plants are um, under stress as are the butterfly. Milkweed forms um, a space for a village or community. And there, it is common to find 15 orders of insects within a milkweed community. Uh, arachnids, uh, daddy long legs is included, um, and a variety of birds. So, Milkweed is essential for other living creatures, not just in Mexico, and to encounter people wearing this and um, one other t-shirt from our local um, great business, Liberty Graphic, right down the road. Again, monarch larvae are totally dependent on milkweed. Um, milkweed doesn't need the monarch for pollinating or anything else. And it does what it can to create defenses against being consumed. Um, the, the toxins, the cardinaloids are one, but also the latex, which is, um, as you may already know, very sticky. And if it dries on the monarch's mouth parts, it creates a seal and the monarch can't eat. By the way, if you're ever touching milkweed, make sure that when you've touched milkweed, whether to, to trim it or to gather it, um, that you wash your hands. It can cause serious eye problems. Um, we already, I already talked about the, the, the larva um, can, can store that toxin in their bodies and not cause them harm, but cause problems for predators. Monarch Watch has the program called Monarch Waystations, which is a program to um, identify areas um, that are good for monarchs, um, especially the milkweed. Uh, but nectaring sources and shelter um, that the monarchs use um, for their life cycle. There are over 32,000 waste stations that have been created um, and 150 of them are in Maine. Uh, Belfast, Sears Island, Lincolnville, uh, among others. 
Monarch Watch offers a, um, a PDF file that is a complete listing of plants for butterfly and pollinator gardens. Um, it's extensive and we'll give you all the information you might require for um, adding to your gardens or planting new ones that are strong supporters of the monarch and other pollinators. Um, branching out from monarchs uh, about the monarch itself, um, the science that's going on. It was only within the past two years that entomologists realized that the wings of butterflies are not just appendages. They are living parts of the butterfly. Um, and you can see here, um, this is a heat uh, image where, where the butterflies store their, um, store the heat, um, reflect the heat and um, send fluid throughout their wings. Um, there's research being done in, with uh, medicine for um, the, the proboscis duplicating the, 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 the proboscis, the mouth part of a butterfly um, in creating uh, needles and uh, other equipment for medicine, engineering, how wings work. Um, this one, I didn't believe until I saw the picture. This is a monarch that is being tracked. This is a um, radio receptor that's been put on the butterfly and the butterfly is released and they track it. This is... Serene, may we get you to conclude? I am, I am, I am two slides away. Okay. Perfect. All right. How to help. Perfect. What can you do? Create the habitat. Um, consider building a, a, creating a way station. Engage in safe mowing practices for the monarchs and for birds. Um, if you're going to uh, cut, you need to cut back your milkweed, um, cut back about half because what happens with that? That milkweed is it will send up new shoots and that's what the monarch female is looking for the freshest milkweed possible be careful or don't use herbicides pesticides um, think about flowers especially for the late migrators the ones that are going south these are organizations that will give you a wealth of information and make connections for you. Educate yourself, um, share information, become active in efforts to counteract climate change on all levels. Down below there's questions or comments. That's an email that if you want to contact me, uh, questions or comments, um, that's a way to do it. Chip Taylor, head of Monarch Watch, just made this um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, gave this parting thought that um, this connection between plants and pollinators are under threat, um, as are nearly all terrestrial ecosystems. And our future is dependent on how well we understand and deal with the connections. Or I put it as if we save the monarchs and their extraordinary migration, we save ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions uh, from Noreen. We, um, we have lost a large field of milkweed to home site. We have some scattered through our lawns. Is there a way to encourage growth, i.e. sand or recommended soil? Um, if they're there, they're probably comfortable being there. What you might want to look out for this year and 
in years ahead is that they are getting enough water. Um, normally, if, if, if we weren't going through a drought, it wouldn't be an issue. But it was so obvious last year, wherever I was looking at milkweed, that it, it needed water. So that would be my main issue. And then just protecting the area so that um, it's not heavily trodden on, because those rhizomes will, will take hold um, and, and can establish themselves. Okay. Um, I've just added um, on the chat the email address to contact mm -hmm. you, sir. So people can um, write that down. And uh, Corliss asked, do the non-migratory monarchs in Europe reproduce? Yes, they do reproduce. And milkweed can be found, um, different varieties can be found around the world. Um, and there are theories as to how our, our milkweed um, traveled to Europe. Uh, as well as the uh, um, monarchs themselves, and um, the there is a there is research going on about the seed dispersal. How did it happen? Um, but it's there. So yes, the the, the colonies uh, do exist, but they do not migrate. Do, are they expanding? Are the populations expanding? The populations of monarchs? Non-migratory. Non, not that I've heard. Um, they are, um, I haven't read any literature about them that being threatened. However, the West Coast monarchs are in dire straits and some people are already considering that Western population to be um, gone. Um, Amy F. in Camden thanks you for the detailed information on monarchs. And she said she knew your mom and endured, adored her from the church in Thank Lincolnville. Um, uh, Barbara says, how do you find one of the Mexico trips to see the butterfly? Um, I found my trip through a recommendation of Monarch Watch. Um, I can provide you the, the name of the group that I went with, and I went with them twice. And the reason I did that was because of a, a second time, when you go on this trip, you have a guide, but then you also have a butterfly expert. And the Andre um, was um, a delight to talk to, knowledgeable, and I really enjoyed him. So I went back with him and I'd be glad to share um, the, the, the company that I worked, that I traveled with. I had Yes, please. It was a total pleasure. Yeah, I can I can provide that. Um, Susan asks, "What about a Sclepius tuberosa? Uh, that's that is one that is easy to grow and spreads readily." The only milkweed that I steer away from, and one of my goals is to have a milkweed garden that has a variety of, of different milkweed, not just main milkweed. Um, the, the one that I tend to stay away from is um, the tropical milkweed. And I stay away from any milkweed that I'm uh, any purchasing any milkweed that I'm not totally convinced is chemical free. Um. Karen says, I have planted seeds of the Asclepius tuberosa, which are starting to grow nicely. Will the monarchs find these? Yes. <laughs> um, they're, monarchs um, are amazing chemical receptors themselves, and they can find, they 
follow where the milkweed is. Um, the picture that I showed of, of our barn in, in Lincolnville, um, there's an air current there that comes over Bald Rock and comes down and, um, and valleys across to um, Levin Cellar Mountain. And the end of June, um, July, suddenly there's a monarch uh, flitting overhead. And, and my belief is that they pick up that scent and that's how they find it. So I think the more exposed an area is, the more likely they are to find it. But that's my, that's my hypothesis. Marjorie asks, is it helpful to raise and release monarchs? Yes and no. It's a wonderful experience to, to learn how to, how to find an egg, how to um, watch the larva grow, um, care for it, um, watch it change and then become a butterfly that you release. It's, there's a real debate on whether doing this adds to the population um, that migrates. The, some people say yes, some people say no. The most important thing to do with the monarch though is to rear it under the most natural conditions possible. I have a large, um, like a reptile cage um, that I have out on my front lawn, that that's where I rear them so that they are in the most natural conditions possible. And that's, that's what you want to strive to do. Um, so does it add to the numbers? It's really questionable, but the learning experience and the joy, um, I think is, is pretty significant. Do you have any other recommendations about containers for raising monarchs in? No, you can, it, it's varied. You want to keep the milkweed fresh. Milk uh, monarchs eat, it, mon the caterpillar eats a lot. So that means they produce a lot of caterpillar poop, which is known as frass. So you want to keep that cleaned up. Um, but again, whatever you can do, to make it the most natural, most well-lit um, situation, that's what you wanna strive for. Okay. And Marilyn asks, if you have milkweed, but monarchs don't find it, how can you encourage them to come? Well, what I would do is I'd go out looking for, um, you can train your eye, to find the eggs and the caterpillars, and you can bring them to your milkweed. You don't want to disturb many of them, but bring them to your milkweed. I don't see any harm in that. Well, Serene, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I believe that uh, Serene is going to or Serene is going to send some information to um, Brenda Harrington that she'll be able to send out to everyone who attended today. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>